Maryland men's lacrosse lost its first Big Ten game in four years, while softball had a huge weekend here at home. Plus, Mike Loxley added some big names to his coaching staff, and an All-American is coming to Xfinity Center next season. All that and more coming up on the left end. You gotta show up and we have to compete. We were fighting uphill all day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Left Bench, presented by Terrapin Sports Central. I'm Ricky Podgorski, joined alongside by Alexa Wooten, and Memorial Day weekend is less than eight weeks away, Alexa which should mean that Maryland men's lacrosse is getting into postseason form. But on Saturday, we found out that the Hartshells are a long way away from being there. A long, long way. For the last four seasons, Maryland has cruised through the Big Ten without losing a game. But on Saturday, Michigan put the brakes on the Terps' dominance. Maryland fell behind early as Michigan lit up the scoreboard with six goals, including a five-goal run. The Terps needed to keep pace, and thanks to two quick goals from Jack Brennan and Danny Maltz, they were back within striking distance. Maryland found itself down one at the half. The momentum from the second quarter seemed to disappear come the third, as three quick Wolverine goals extended their lead. Michigan had the Terps on upset alert and never took its foot off the gas. The dominant fourth quarter extended the Wolverines' lead as four goals put a nail in Maryland's coffin. The Terps got one goal back thanks to Caden Onagi faking out a defender, but it was too little, too late. And Michigan took this one 16 to 11. Here's John Tillman after the loss. I just felt like we were a little bit of a step behind today. I felt like we were fighting uphill all day. Um, so, you know, what did we practice? What did we not practice? Did we practice too much? Did we practice too little? Um, you know, things like that. Where, where did we get, um, where do we have breakdowns and where can we get better? Um, we do have a lot of young guys out there. Um, so, and a lot of guys in new spots. So, um, you know, it's still about the teachable moments and trying to improve. Maryland has had some rough patches this season, including losses to Loyola and Notre Dame. But the Michigan loss is cause for a concern as the regular season winds down. Nathan Schwartz has more on how the Wolverines pulled off the upset. I just felt like we were a little bit of a step behind today. I felt like we were fighting uphill all day. That's what Maryland men's lacrosse head coach John Tillman had to say after a shocking 16-11 loss to Michigan, which now puts the Terps at three losses on the season. Saturday's game against Michigan was the first time Maryland lost a conference game since May 2nd, 2019 against Johns Hopkins. And nobody expected the Terps to drop this one, which leaves one question to be asked. How did the Wolverines pull off the upset? The main difference in this one was the face-offs. Luke Weirman struggled to get into a rhythm, and Michigan took full advantage. The Wolverines dominated the face-off throughout most of the game, especially in the second half when they got five more face-off wins than the Terps. In the face-offs, right, they go four, seven, and third, and six of eight in the fourth. Um, you know, you're just, you're losing the possession battle there. So now you have to do a really good job of getting stops, getting it out, and managing your possessions. And we just didn't do a great job. And with that face-off dominance came multiple runs for Michigan. The Wolverines put together a five-goal run in the first, a three-goal run in the third, and a four-goal run in the fourth. Those three runs put Maryland in a major hole and has seemingly become a weekly occurrence for the Terps defense. We've seen it happen a few times. Last week against Penn State, we gave a goal run of five or so. We did that against Notre Dame and Virginia. So just got to cut back on that battle through adversity and build on our team's good momentum plays and kind of let that carry us through the rest of the game. Speaking of high momentum plays, Maryland didn't have many against Michigan's defense. Less than half of the Terp shots were shots on goal, and both of Michigan's goalkeepers made it tough for the Maryland attackers to get clean looks. Um, didn't finish opportunities. I didn't feel like we shot particularly well. Um, you know, I felt like at times we were trying to work harder, not smarter. Michigan came into this one with nothing to lose and pulled off one of the biggest collegiate lacrosse upsets in recent history, giving Maryland's remaining opponents the blueprint on how to defeat the defending national champions. For Terrapin Sports Central, I'm Nathan Schwartz.
Nate filled us in on a lot right there, but to talk about what the loss means for the trajectory of Maryland's season, we now welcome on Brandon Schwartzberg, who covers the team for the Diamondback. Brandon, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, guys. Now, Brandon, this was Maryland's first in-conference loss since 2019. Where exactly did the Terps fall short? Yeah, you know, I think it really started with that first quarter. Uh, after a few goals from each side early on, Michigan then went on that 5-0 run and just gave themselves confidence. And you could see it. The sideline was energetic, and it just continued throughout the game. I mean, the story for Maryland this season has been a game of runs. Seemingly, each and every game, there's a run of at least three goals from one side or both. And against Michigan, the Wolverines got the first run and just never looked back. And then you mentioned that 5-0 and run. How did Maryland let that happen? Yeah, uh, the defense, it, it just did not look good early on, to be frank. Um, Michigan's offense really looked good. And honestly, a lot of it came from the faceoff wins. Michigan won over 50% of their faceoffs against Maryland. I mean, coming in, they were two of the top 10 teams in the nation in faceoffs, and Michigan just won them. And for Maryland, that's what a lot of their offense has been. They've needed to get a lot of possessions because of how inefficient it's been. And since Michigan won a bunch of those early faceoffs and then throughout the game, Maryland just never got into a comfortable groove in its offense. Now, not only was this loss the first in conference since, loss since 2019, but the fr it's the third loss of the season for this team. And a national championship caliber team, what needs to change in order to get back to that national championship? Yeah, I just I think that if they can, they've got to find a way to improve the offense once they get in the half court, in the half field, because a lot of their successful offense has been through transition, has been with Dante Trader, even Luke Weirman at times, or the defenders, John Keppert, just getting in transition goals. Once they get into sets, they've not been efficient. They've been honestly lethargic, and especially the past two third quarters against Penn State, against Michigan, they've come out, looked bad on offense. I believe they only had three goals total in those two second, in those two third quarters, and it, it just needs to change if they want to win the national championship. Now looking forward, Maryland is hitting the road to take on Ohio State this Friday. What adjustments do Tillman and his team need to make so that they can have a successful game? Yeah, I think they just have to reset. Um, it's, they, they've had a tough schedule. I mean, the win, the loss against Notre Dame, the win against Virginia, even the win against Penn State, those were big games that they got up for. And then for Michigan, it was a game where they were supposed to win and they didn't. So I think they just need to reset, refocus, because they've got three games coming up against Ohio State, Johns Hopkins, and Rutgers, where all of them are ranked opponents. And so they need to close out their regular season strong as they enter the Big Ten tournament and then the NCAA tournament. Well, Brandon, that's all the time we have. But thank you so much for coming on the show and talking with us. Thanks for having me, guys. You can follow Brandon on Twitter at bschwartzberg03 and read his coverage of the Terps at dbknews.com. Well, Maryland women's lacrosse is trending in the opposite direction. Earlier this week, Shaylin Ahern, Abby Bosco, Eloise Clevenger, and Libby May were named midseason All-Americans. Then on Sunday, those four and more came up big in the Terps' 13-7 win over Michigan. The combination of 16 draw controls, 12 saves from Emily Sterling, and five goals from May propelled Maryland to a dominant win. Michigan scored three straight goals in the third quarter, but early in the fourth, Chrissy Thomas swung the momentum. She scored on this play, and less than a minute later, she set up May with an up-top assist. Sterling had three more saves as Maryland coasted to the victory. The win extends the Terps' winning streak to seven, and they'll look to continue it against John Hopkins tomorrow at CQ Stadium. Here's Kathy Reese after her team's seventh straight win. As we even talk about this today, and yes, you look at the men's game yesterday, and you look at look at NCAA basketball. Like, look at what we're watching. Like this, and even in our landscape of lacrosse, every you got to play the game. Like, you got to play. It doesn't matter who you're playing. It doesn't matter where. It doesn't matter when. You got to show up, and we have to compete. And so, it's really just reemphasize our focus on ourselves of how we need to be the best Maryland team we can be against anybody we play. And and um, and we got to play the full 60 minutes. I mean, look at the first basketball game last night, right? Like the the shot at the very end of the game to make San Diego State win. It's just a huge reminder that like these, you got to compete. We got to compete for the full 60 minutes. And Over to basketball now. And just a few days after the departure of Maryland assistant coach Tony Skin, Kevin Willard has found his new guy. Mike Jones, the former associate head coach at Virginia Tech, is on his way to College Park to join Kevin Willard's staff. The former Old Dominion standout has been a USA basketball head coach and was the longtime head coach about two miles down the road at DeMatha Catholic. Jones was Jameer Young's coach in high school, and oh yeah, Hunter Dickinson's as well. He just entered the transfer portal. Jones will be most certainly a huge pull for DMV recruits in the coming years.
But Maryland women's basketball leading scorer Diamond Miller has declared for the 2023 WNBA draft. Miller made her announcement on social media thanking her family, teammates, and coaches. Miller averaged 19.7 points per game this year and was named to the All Big Ten first team. In recent mock drafts, Miller is projected to go number two overall, just behind South Carolina's Aaliyah Boston. Not only is Miller moving on, but Maryland is losing three more players from this past year for another reason, the transfer portal. Two days after the Terps season ended in the Elite Eight, freshman Mila Reynolds announced via Twitter that she would be entering the portal. A little under four hours later, her younger sister, Amia, announced she was withdrawing her commitment from Maryland. The next day, freshman guard Ava Scolia announced that she was also going portaling. Then another first-year player, guard Gia Cook, announced the same decision, making her the third member of Maryland's 2022 recruiting class to leave. Now, while Maryland is losing some very good players to the draft and transfer portal, they're gaining an All-American. 2023 commit Riley Nelson was named a McDonald's All-American back in January, and last week she went down to Houston for the game. I was there to catch all the action. I'm here at the McDonald's All-American Games, and so is a future term. Five-star Maryland commit Riley Nelson is here in Houston as one of the top 24 high school girls basketball players in the country. Once I found out I was an All-American, you know, they were pushing, everyone was excited for me. It was just a great moment because this is something you always dream about, dream about when you're a kid. So you never think it's going to happen to you, and when it actually does, it's kind of surreal. Nelson's week consisted of a visit to the Ronald McDonald House, Houston, where she and her fellow All-Americans got to spend time with the family staying in the home. Three days of practices with her teammates on the East team, the Powerade Jam Fest where Nelson won the girls' knockout competition and competed against Baylor commit Jacoby Walter for the ultimate champion. Nelson fell short to Walter after multiple rounds of non-stop threes by both players. And to end out the week, the girls' 2023 McDonald's All-American game, which happened to be the highest scoring girls game in its history. For us to come together to try to win this thing, uh, our McDonald's All-American game, like, that was amazing to me. Nelson played well all week. A strong athletic wing slash guard with a soft shooting touch. The incoming freshman's play resembles Maryland's star this past season, Diamond Miller. Both taller and lankier guards who can score at all three levels, plus both disciplined defenders. Nelson should be a great addition for Frieza's squad. Maryland was one of the first schools I visited. Um, and I didn't actually want to go to Maryland because it was so close to home. But once I got there, I felt that Brenda had this super like family atmosphere. And I could tell she really cared about her players and you know, she recruited me hard. So you know, I felt like every other place I went to just didn't compare. Congratulations to Riley on an incredible honor. And Terps fans, be on the lookout for Nelson next season at Xfinity Center. It just was an incredible experience to get to go down to Houston and watch the 48 best high school boys and girls basketball players compete against one another. And Riley won the knockout competition. I think we should challenge her when she comes to College Park. Well, don't go anywhere because when we come back, we'll take a look at how Maryland baseball and softball fared this past weekend. We'll also tell you which NFL players paid Coach Locks a visit last week and break down the new faces on his staff. Stay with us. I tell my son, I love you every single day. Now my dad has never said that to me. Not because he doesn't love me, but because culturally it wasn't comfortable for him. Now that he's a grandfather, he says I love you to my son every time he sees him. My advice to all the fathers out there, forget the cultural restrictions. They grow up way too fast for you to waste even a single precious moment. So far, a place that I call home. I'm teaching Louise how to cook some lasagna. You don't need to spot to make a fire start. Thank you. Let's study, please. Find a place to make my own, a place that I call home. 
this place that I call home. Welcome back. This is The Left Bench brought to you by Terrapin Sports Central. Marky Podgorski, Alexa Bootman, and don't look now, but Maryland baseball is heating up. Yeah, the Iowa faithful might have been busy watching Caitlin Clark ball out in the Final Four this weekend. So they're probably happy if they didn't watch what Matt Shaw and Maryland did to the Hawkeyes baseball team this weekend. I would be. A tornado ripped through eastern Iowa on Friday, and his name was Matt Shaw. In game one, Shaw hit an absolute nuke, 507 feet for the Dirty Terps' sixth Grand Slam of the year. If this ball were hit at the Bob, it would have nearly reached Stadium Drive. Unreal power. Another Shaw homer and a couple more from Elijah Lambros and Nick LaRusso would lift Maryland to the 10-9 win in game one. Shaw's hot streak continued on Saturday, recording three RBIs in his four at-bats. LaRusso led the Terps with three hits in game two as Maryland knocked off Iowa again 7-4. Game 3 seemed to be more of the same for Maryland as Bobby's Marslak's fourth uh, four RBIs helped push his team out to a 6-1 lead. The Hawkeyes rallied in the fifth, through, although pl plating nine runs, which proved to be too much for the Dirty, ter dirty Terps, and Iowa took the finale 12-8. Maryland softball entered this weekend riding its best start since 2008. The Terps piled onto that success by sweeping the series against Michigan State, culminating with an 8-0 victory over the Spartans on Sunday. Courtney Weish was on fire, setting the tone early by striking out the side in the first inning. The Terps offense got rolling in the second with back-to-back -back doubles from Amelia Lake and Michaela Jones, helping them to an early lead. Weish continued her dominance with two more strikeouts in the third, and the Terps followed suit with even more fireworks in the bottom half as Jada McFarland circled the diamond for an inside-the-park home run. After allowing her first and only hit of the afternoon, Weish struck out two more Spartans. She finished with 12 Ks in just six innings of work. An RBI double by Sydney Lewis ended the game by Mercy Rule in the sixth. Another impressive win for the Terps. Here's Coach Mark Montgomery post-game. Well, I, I, I think this whole weekend went well. We, we pitched it really well, we played defense really well, and we hit it pretty well. So whenever you've got all three elements of the game, you're going to have usually good weekends. So uh, another great day at the office for Courtney, 12 strikeouts and you know, out of 18 outs. I mean, that's, that's pretty special, and, and that allows the defense to settle in. Maryland Tennis's four-game win streak was snapped on Sunday in College Park as the Terps fell to number 19, Wisconsin. Maryland struggled in the return game and couldn't find any momentum all match long. Marta perez Murr and Menorca Miranda fell 3-6 in doubles, and the Terps were only able to win one of six single matches. That one, that one win came from Callista Liu. Here's head coach Katie Doherty with more. We talked all week. I mean, we knew this was a great team, top 20 um, coming in. And being outdoors was going to be to our favor, and we needed to, you know, use the great equalizer, which was, you know, the wind and the sun. And really, this came down to, to battling. I mean, you know, both teams are, are strong. Everyone's in mid-season form, and um, you know, it came down to winning some deuce points and uh, making great decisions. And you know, I think they probably did a little bit better job than we did today. Number 24 Maryland Gymnastics finished in fourth place at the second session of the NCAA Pittsburgh Regional Friday night, setting a program record with its highest team score ever at a regional, a 196.675. The Terps started out on bars, posting a program record in regional with a 49.275. Maryland moved on to the beam where Josephine Cogler excelled, earning a 9.9. .9. The Terps then went to the floor and posted another regional program record score of 49.3. Maryland finished out on vault where Alexis Rubio scored a 9.825. This regional was the Terps' last stop this season, but what an outstanding one it was. Absolutely great season for the gymnastics team. Well, I'm sure you were tricked by an April Fool's joke or two on Saturday, but if you saw NFL wide receivers Jalen Waddell and Devontae Smith paying a visit to Coach Locks on social media, it wasn't Photoshop or AI. Loxley was the offensive coordinator at Alabama from 2016 to 2018 when Smith and Waddle were playing for the Tide. Looks like the two NFL studs were hanging out with Lox at Jones Hill House, and hey, they look great with that Maryland merch on. Can only imagine what kind of an impact they could have made in College Park. The world will never know Ricky, but the world will know about Chad Ryland, who later this month could be the first Maryland kicker drafted into the NFL since 1989. Our Kurt Massline has more. For Chad Ryland, preparing for the NFL draft means taking things one kick at a time. Last week, that meant a return to College Park for Maryland's Pro Day. 
the latest step in a draft process that's taken him across the country. Ryland's path to the draft started in Mobile, Alabama, where he played in the Senior Bowl and spent a week working with NFL coaches, giving him a glimpse into a professional kicking environment. It was an honor because it was almost one of those full circle moments. It's like, oh shoot, the hard work's actually paying off. But there's more to draft prep than big events like the Senior Bowl and the Combine. Ryland spends three to four days kicking and two days lifting every week. He's had private workouts with teams and trained with former NFL kickers and long snappers. All of it to prepare him for the jump to the next level. The thing for me, I think, is just my ball striking ability. And almost like a baseball pitcher or a golfer is being able to manipulate my foot body position to make the ball do what I want to do in specific conditions. The next few weeks will feature some more meetings and workouts with teams as Ryland looks to become the first Maryland kicker drafted since 1989, and possibly the fourth kicker in program history to play in the NFL. But regardless of what happens at the end of April, Ryland knows that the work is just getting started. No matter what, going into fall camp, I'm gonna have to make kicks to win the job, win the building over, and get the trust of the guys. For Terrapin Sports Central, I'm Kurt Massline. You know, Alexa, I was at Pro Day and I was able to speak with Chad and he said that he believes he is one of the best of the 32 kickers in the entire world. And that's exactly what you need to be to be able to kick in the NFL. I'm very excited to see where he ends on draft night and how his NFL career pans out. Absolutely. And speaking of the NFL draft, it is underway Thursday, April 27th in Kansas City. But college football is always on the dome here in College Park and some new faces will be joining Mike Loxley on the sideline next fall. And to tell us who they are and what to expect, Sam Jane joins us now from Studio B. Sam, if you told me that a former SEC Coach of the Year would be on Lock Locksley's staff next year, I would have asked how he convinced Nick Saban to leave his empire down in Tuscaloosa. But I guess that's not what happened. No, unfortunately he couldn't pull that off. But it's still a pretty big name setting up shop here in CP. Ten years ago, I'm sure the college football world would have been stunned to see Kevin Sumlin leaving the XFL which didn't even exist for an assistant job here at Maryland. But that's exactly where the former Texas A&M coach finds himself heading into next season. Someone was hired as the tight ends coach and associate head coach, bringing the experience and versatility that Coach Loxley wanted to add to his staff. It'll be interesting to see if someone can recapture some of that magic he had while with the Aggies, because he does have a smaller quarterback who loves dancing around in the pocket and extending plays yet again. Of course, it's not the Heisman winner, Money Manziel, but someone will provide some of the head coaching experience that Loxley's staff lacked this past season. And a guy who surely had head coaching aspirations after winning the most prestigious assistant coach award you can is now in the OC role here in College Park. That's Josh Gaddis. Gaddis was the Broyles Award winner while at Michigan and helped lead the Wolverines to their first win over Ohio State in nearly a decade. But the former Alabama coach decided he didn't really like the cold and he took his talents down to South Beach, hoping to bring the U's offense back to its glory days. Instead, it was a disaster, as the Hurricanes offense never quite got up off the ground, limping to a mere 24 points per game. So, Gaddis drew back to his roots with an old assistant coach he coached with in Tuscaloosa, joining Coach Locks here at Maryland. Another good year could allow Gaddis to throw his name back into the head coaching ring once again, so it'll be interesting to see how he deals with the pressure. Gaddis and Sumlin got the pub, but what it might have been the best hire that Coach Loxley made was bringing in Latrell Scott as the new running backs coach. Scott has a ton of experience. He was a head coach at Norfolk State before leaving to become an assistant at East Carolina, where he coached some really talented players along the way. But when he steps into the Jones Hill house this spring, he might be surprised to see the absolute studs he has in the running back room. Maryland natives Antoine Littleton and Roman Hemby lead a backfield that should carry the load for the Terps offense in 2023. They both have a unique connection with their new position coach though, as Scott is also from the DMV area where Hemby and Littleton hail. That's where Scott could make his money the most, I believe, on the recruiting trail in the DMV. Having local connections is paramount in recruiting, we know, and it feels like bringing Scott back into the fold was a very smart move by the man at the helm. For the last coaching hire of this offseason, we head back to Texas, where it seems nearly every Hall of Fame coach and player has hailed from. And that's where the home of the new Terp Safeties coach is. Zach Spavital has been a coach in the Lone Star State his whole life, it seems, 
with assistant stops at Houston, Texas A&M, and most recently Texas State as the DC. But Spavital decided to trade in Tex-Mex for Crabs, and he'll inherit a safety unit with two returning starters. Dante Trader and Bo Braid lead a back line that lost two starting cornerbacks to the NFL. They'll be looking to lead a new look background and a new look secondary for the Terps this year. But Brady especially flashed some leadership skills that will make the transition for Spavital so much easier. And guys, that seems to be the theme for all these coaches. Each of them have players in their position rooms who've been on the field and performed for the Terps. Yeah, it's the new reality in college football. Coaches move in and out just as fast as the players. Thanks, Sam. Now, keep it right here because when we come back, you'll get to hear a great call from this past week of Maryland sports. And we'll name our Terp of the Week Pro Terp and Top 5 plays. Don't go anywhere. Hey world, I have a quick message. It's about safe driving. All right, let's go. Anytime you're driving, have the seatbelt buckle tight, both hands on the wheel and your phone out of sight. We're not in your hand trying to text somebody back because if you do, your car might get smacked. The moral of the story, just put your phone down. The people on the road will stay safe and sound. Put your phone down, put your phone down. People on the road will stay safe and sound. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back once again to the Left Bench. I'm Ricky Podgorski here with Alexa Wooten. And Ricky, let's not waste any time getting right into our call of the week. Yeah, we're going back to CQ Stadium on Sunday when Libby shined on the turf. And we knew the guy on the call. Here's Nathan Schwartz. May charges, shoots, and scores. Libby May has a hat trick here in the third quarter. Her third goal makes it 8-6 to six Maryland. I mean, we could have done four more of those because Libby May scored five times against the Wolverines. Yeah, she's turned into an exceptional player and leader for Kathy Reese's squad, but she fell just short of earning our Terp of the Week honors because we just had to go with the star at the plate this weekend for the Dirty Terps, Matt Shaw. Shaw had four hits and two home runs against number 22 Iowa on Friday. And as you saw earlier, one of those traveled 507 feet in the top of the six. Just look at that one fly. His second shot came in the eighth, giving him 10 homers on the season, the second most on the team. On Saturday, the future big leaguer recorded three RBIs, including a game-winning two-run single that gave Maryland the series victory over the Hawkeyes. Huge congrats to Matt. And for our Pro Terp, it's a privilege to give the honor to former Terrapin Sports Central writer and editor, Logan Hill. Logan will be starting a new job in Tawanda, Pennsylvania as a high school sports reporter for the Daily Review this week. You may remember Logan for his writing with TSC or possibly as an iconic personality on the left bench. No matter how you remember Logan's time here, it's common knowledge that he's an extremely hard worker and passionate about what he does. We all know you're going to kill it in PA, Logan, and we wish you nothing but the best in your new position. Congrats to Low Goat Hill on being named our pro turf. Can't wait to see what Logan does out there in Pennsylvania. Well, Alexa, let's roll right into our top five plays of the week. Get us going with number five. Coming in at number five is Kanan Onagi's fake out goal against a Michigan defender. Let's watch that one more time. Fakes the defender left, rolls right, and the low sidearm shot flies past the goalie. And at number four, we have Maryland softball's Jada McFarland with a nice hit that looks to be a single. But a Michigan State error allows McFarland to round the bases all the way to second and then pursue third and eventually slide all the way into home for the in the park home run. What a play by Jada McFarland. And now number three, Libby May went off on Sunday, scoring five. That's right, five goals. Here's just one of her beautiful finishes. May cuts down the middle, a feed from Lubecker, and a quick sh stick shot by May. And at number two, we have Elijah Lambros, who pans the outfield and robs a home run score. Lambros was killing it all weekend long. This one, look how close that was to going right out, snags it right over the fence. And our number one play of the week, you've already seen it, bases loaded and Matt Shaw blasts it 507 feet, a grand slam. Shaw brings himself and three others home, giving Maryland the lead. I mean, what an amazing weekend for Shaw. Matt Shaw's hitting is remarkable. But that'll do it for this edition of The Left Bench. Nathan Schwartz and Jonas Evans will be with you next Tuesday to recap what should be another exciting weekend of Maryland sports. Be sure to keep up with all of our Terrapin Sports Central coverage on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and online at terrapinsportscentral.com. We'll see you next time.